two cases. Um, Mr. Nish, the defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Nish, the defense is still here also on behalf of the defense. Are you ready to proceed? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, there is a pre-sentence report that has been filed. Were there any matters that needed to be addressed prior to uh, this? I don't believe so. Nothing from the defense. Our name was after. All right. Mr. Nish, go ahead and I will hear from you first. I didn't invite your client to say anything if he wishes. But Your Honor, as a matter of courtesy, I, I tend to, in these types of cases, like to defer to the family if the defendant is willing to speak to the court. Um, if that's okay, I'd like to make that difference. Mr. Uh, Worrell, do you have any input on that? Well, the only, I mean, maybe for the defense counsel that's fine, but I think that it's important for the family at least here, if, if you know, Mr. Bear has anything he wants to say, I think it's important for the family to hear that first. This is telling you, but. We agree with that. We think that the defendant has anything to say to right here first. And that's fine, Your Honor. All right. I just, as a matter of courtesy, I'd like to make that difference. All right. Thank you. It is my practice, General, to allow the defense to proceed first uh, for that very reason expressed by um, plaintiffs. Go ahead, as we were Your Honor, there's not a lot to say from the defense on this. Uh, we reached a resolution with the state that involved a rule that an eye conference with the court, wherein my client would be guilty as charged. And then the 
not just from not just from me or his mom or his brother and sister. You took away some someone who was willing to be active in the society and contribute to society. As far as I can tell, in your whole entire life, you've never contributed to society, to society once. Dylan helped you out so many times, whether it be hauling sugar beets or potatoes or whatever, and this is how you repay him. Um, I just basically hope that you, for the rest of your life, can think about this. And if a three to 30 year comes about and you get out, it'd probably be the worst thing that ever happened to you, Jim. And in that time, I, man, this is hard. I just hope you, the rest of your life, you remember what you did and, you, and how, what you did. And I hope sometime you feel some remorse or some guilt. That's, that's basically all I have to say. And I wasn't gonna let you just come in here and limp like a little gimp and, and walk out with nobody saying anything to you at all. You don't have the balls enough to look at anybody in the eye or even look at anybody. You turn around and look at the people who you've affected. That's all I have to say. Thank you.
who's left the city far too soon. James Brenner, the man who took Dylan's life, was no stranger to his family. Dylan gave him work in the middle of nowhere. He paid him to work on his farm. Dylan's family knew James Brenner. He had done farming work in Idaho and stayed in Camp Taylor on their property. They had meals together. They were not strangers. Despite that relationship, not only did he commit the senseless crime of taking Dylan away from them, he intentionally prolonged their torment for two years by making them leave the property where Dylan was last seen, by hiding evidence, by trying to confuse the investigation, by returning evidence. And ultimately, he only came forward with the truth so that he could cut a deal and reduce his sentence. His callous disregard for his family, these people who he knew personally, after doing something so devastating to this family, it had no consideration, no compassion, and no empathy for them at any time. That is who this man truly is. This was not an accident. This is calculated, and every action for two years since has been calculated as well, in an effort to try to get away with the cold-hearted murder of Joe Knotts. <clears throat> the acceptance of a plea deal means that today the court will not impose a sentence. The plea deal brings some measure of resolution, but it does not ease the profound sorrow and the sense of injustice that this family feels. Dylan's life was worth more than any plea agreement can acknowledge. He was a young man with dreams that reached far beyond the horizon, and his loss is left a void that can never be filled. Dylan's life did not matter to James Brennan, but he mattered to me, a complete stranger. He mattered to Justin, Candace and Mike. He mattered to Colton and Brooklyn. He mattered to Terry, Denise, Larry, Karen, his dog, Hank, the whole entire family. Dylan's life mattered to everyone but not James Brenner. So, as I'm here today, I would like us to remember Dylan not just as a victim, but as a young man with boundless potential and a heart full of dreams. His legacy will live on with the foundation his family formed to help other families in similar situations. Though we cannot change the past or undo the pain, we can honor Dylan by ensuring that his story is never forgotten and by continuing to seek justice for all victims like him. Dylan's family, despite their unimaginable loss, has shown extraordinary strength and resilience. They have carried the torch of his dreams and his memory, making sure that Dylan's light will shine brightly, even in the darkest of times. Thank you. Thank you. Coming out a few things on there. Um, much like Justin, I, I was curious to see what the, what, what uh, Mr. Brenner's reactions and his cooperation with the pre-sense report, um, his demeanor in the courtroom today, you know, uh, hoping and expecting to see some remorse. Um, and it was so frustrating and so sad to see that it is just totally absent in this pre-sense report. Um, right, you know, right out the gate, we have a, a note that he initially did not want to speak with the investigator, would not complete his pre-sentence um, packet. Um, we read that he rationalized the offense, placing blame on the victim, does not appear to take responsibility for his actions. Um, they know that he poses a significant public safety threat as evidenced by his pattern of social behavior. And certainly that's true. They know that, they know a uh, criminal history that spans four decades. And over those four decades, we have a, a man who's engaged in numerous violent offenses over the years, leaving a, a wake of victims in, in, behind him. Um, truly, truly, just sad and frustrating. I, don't, I can't think of another adjective. But as if that's not bad enough, I get, you know, we get to the pro-criminal attitude aspect of it. It says, Mr. Brenner placed considerable blame for his current situation on the victim, taking no accountability for his actions, and even go on to quote him, saying, he shows no remorse or accountability for his behavior, stating, quote, I lost everything I own except land and a checking account. I'm not paying because a bastard broke into my place. Disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. We, stand, we, we come before this court with a man, like I said, with a criminal history of four decades and a total lack of empathy for, for anyone and everything. And I, 
I think Justin said it best when he, when he commented on just kind of that demeanor and behavior with all this. So, so sad to see that. Um, and, you know, I'm glad we have, you know, we were able to locate the body and return, you know, Dylan to his family. Um, but it did come at a cost. It came at a cost. And that had nothing to do with, you know, trying to do the right thing or trying to help the family get some closure. It had everything to do with self-preservation. And that shouldn't be lauded. I mean, I'm glad we were able to bring, bring Dylan home, but that's not something that we should, I guess, give Mr. Brown credit for. It was a means to an end for him, and I, it's what it's always been. Um, and so it's, it's just so sad. We have the recommendation, there's no surprise on the sentencing. It comports with what we talked about, the three years to 30 uh, on the sentencing. And quite honestly, I, I think that, that uh, Mr. Brenner will serve most, if not all of that, and he deserves to, quite honestly. I think his past has finally caught up to him. I, I feel so bad for what everybody's been through as far as the emotional roller coaster of you know the case and getting to this point finally. It's a relief that we're finally here, but that relief doesn't do anything about the ultimate consequences. Dylan's never coming home. As I read through the, the, the letters and statements from people, my heart breaks. To talk about uh, how the impact this kid, you know, Dylan had on their lives and just the positivity and the, the light that he brought to others, and that that they'll never see that again. And you contrast that with Mr. Brenner, and I, Justin said it right, he's never contributed anything to society. It's such a stark contrast between Mr. Brenner and his take on things, and Dylan, and yet one of them is in his courtroom living today. So sad, so sad. So there's not a lot I can say, I don't want to overshadow certainly what the statements or what you know, the statements we've heard here today say, that's the more important thing. But um, so with that, I'll defer to your honor. And again, just express my deepest sympathies. That's, that's so cliche and overstated. But truly, I just my heart breaks for the family and everyone involved in this. And with that, I'll say. Thank you. Mr. Your Honor, I think what Justin needed to be said about Dylan today has been said that he was an incredible young man. He, he had his whole life ahead of him. He was a hard worker. He knew how to love, and he was loved. And so many people uh, who loved him are here today, and they have fought for justice for him. Um, it is, I, I appreciate the word that the state used, disturbing. It's disgusting, and it's horrific to really witness and experience the lack of remorse. It's really quite evil. And Mr. Brenner has demonstrated that he's unredeemable. And I know that's as harsh, you know, as we can say, but he he's clearly made no effort to bring comfort to this family and to take responsibility. To this day, he blames this young man for what he did. Sometimes we need to make unorthodox, unorthodox requests and ask for difficult things. But I would ask that Mr. Brenner have to look back at the galley and look at who is here to support Dylan today. I know they will be respectful, but he needs to be faced with what devastation he has caused. And I would just ask that he be required to look back and view those who are here in support of Dylan today. Thank you, Mr. Stout. Mr. Rich. I would have a lot to say, Your Honor, and my client not ask me to be extremely respectful and to not go into the details of the couple of lying case in chief. I'll start by saying I appreciate the collegiality, the professionalism of my colleagues. This is a hard case. It's a hard case for everybody. And just because we're defense counsel and we have a job to do doesn't mean that we don't also recognize the pain and the heartache that goes on with the victims. In fact, we see it not as intimately maybe as Mrs. Tell does for the prosecutor to do, but we see it because we're actively involved in the things that happen in this case. And my, I, I join my colleagues in that uh, extending condolences and heartfelt to the family. I would ask the court not to impose the request by Ms. Mistel as it would be improper. And also, I believe it would not be something that an extrajudicial punishment, but the statutes and laws don't allow it. 
just be the, the modern day equivalent of putting somebody in stocks. Not appropriate. Not um, Other than that, Your Honor, there's a lot of things I'd like to say, and I'll hold my peace and submit. As I've um, read the information that the panel has provided in the letters um, and the things that Dylan accomplished in his life and the drive and the desire and the things that he had to make life better, um, not just for himself, but for um, those around him and the love that he had for life. Um, this is not um, a proper ending for someone like that. And uh, my, my heart does go out to the family um, for your loss and for having missed him. And you'll we'll continue to miss him uh, around you. It's a, a, a hard request, Mrs. Stone. And um, I don't want to jeopardize this proceeding in that fashion. The one thing I will say is I will ask Mr. Brenner if you would, I would like you to stand and I would like you to face them if you would do that. By then, Your Honor, I'd like to know you. Yes, the, the gallery. Your Honor, is that an order? Was that a request? It's a request. Based on the two, three second degree felonies, it will be the order of the court to serve one to 15 years on each one of those. Those are run consecutive. Um, I will give you credit for the time you've served only on those two cases, 171 and 110, no other cases. Um, this is in accordance with the agreement, um, and I want to respect the family with that. So I'm following that agreement. But I am going to recommend the parole board that they um, keep you as long as they legally can. And that's my recommendation to the parole board. Uh, I think that's the only leeway I have in this sentencing to offer the family. And with that, that will be the sentence. Um, anything further, Mr. Manish? Your Honor, I haven't heard anything yet on restitution. Have we seen? So, we would like to have us in the file. We would like to leave that open for a little bit because there may be, you know, now that we have the body and you know, work on funeral expenses and things like that, that will be forthcoming. Um, so, we would like to leave that open. I think the statute allows us a year, right? I mean, it's a year. So, if that's okay, that's what we would expect. In that case, Your Honor, I'll decline to withdraw as counsel today. I'll stay on as counsel for purposes of making sure the restitution is taken care of in time. All right. Anything for the prosecution? Mr. Stella, anything no. else? All right. Once again, um, I wish the family the best. 